Welcome to the Foul Play YouTube channel. Hey everyone, welcome. Welcome to Coffee with Foul Play podcast. And in this episode, it's called Let's Work with KZ, episode number three. Wow. And uh, I'd like to welcome you all. Welcome, beautiful people. My name is Dr. Silkman. Now, uh, before we start the podcast, <laughs> you would have to be living on another planet not to realize the uh, dire consequences of the oh, coronavirus infection that we have at the episode moment. And um, I want to wish and I hope that you and your family and loved ones are all safe uh, from this uh, coronavirus. And I think that if we all display a bit of uh, common sense and vigilance, we can definitely defeat the virus. But um, it's likely that it will probably likely be a 6 to 12 month effort. Uh, I can assure you that... Um, all the scientists and other governing bodies are doing their very best to defeat the virus. Um, <clears throat> they know what the virus is. They know the molecular biology. Uh, and uh, people are designing um, a vaccine. So, you know, stay safe, stay, stay strong. And uh, we're very proud to have you guys here on the channel uh, listening to us. Um, that's awesome especially under very trying times. Um, all right, guys. Well, joining us today uh, on our podcast, we have our regular researchers. Uh, we have BB, Jack61, Kelly, Neverly, and Spooky67. And monitoring our chat today, guys, so write down your questions. We'll try and answer them. And what we'll do, guys, we'll answer the questions, your questions, at the end uh, of my presentation. And we'll try and get through as many questions as possible. Monitoring the chat are Katnit, Lily, Sammy, and Zoe. Our special researcher guest today is Nan's Life 7. And uh, we welcome Nan's Life um, to the podcast. And, guys, all of us at Foul Play. We're really, really thankful, guys. We have 912 subscribers, and that's awesome. And now our uh, YouTube uh, channel has generated over or close to 260,000 views of our videos, and that's fantastic. So, guys, if you like what we do, uh, hit the subscribe button, and please leave your DNA on the thumbs up if you enjoy what we're doing. And we appreciate all your comments and uh, we try and uh, uh, act on your uh, suggestions and comments and we try to do the very best that we can. Uh, at Foul Play, we have very much a team approach uh, and I'm so grateful to be surrounded by some really top class people who, remember, we're all doing this as a hobby and yet we have people uh, in the channel all the time, monitoring the uh, chat line, um, BB, Lily, Sammy, Zoe are always on monitoring the chat line and welcoming new people all the time, which is awesome. But the other major thing, of course, guys, is that we have a, a website that contains a huge amount of information about the Brendan Dassey and Stephen Avery cases. We have a Facebook presence, we have Twitter, and we also, of course, have Discord, where, where somebody basically is here 24-7 uh, around the clock to hopefully answer your questions. Uh, and I really would like to comment that uh, we've now got a brand new podcast um, done by the Powder Puffs, and uh, that's awesome. It's been really well received, and it's fantastic to get a, a female perspective on all aspects of the case, but not only the case cases, but other things as well. And I'd like to congratulate the ladies on their very first Powder Puff podcast. Uh, it was awesome, absolutely awesome. And I probably have to beg the Powder Puffs to get a guest spot uh, panel. Will you guys let me on one of your Powder Puff um, 
uh, podcast. <laughs> I bet that's doable. <laughs> okay, um, guys, the check is in the mail, so to speak. Well, look, guys, thank you very much. And I realise that uh, we are all working under uh, extreme conditions with the coronavirus and uh, we'll try and do our very best with the podcast. We'll try and keep it a little bit shorter this time, um, but please enjoy. All right, so guys, what we'll do, we'll make a start on the podcast proper and we'll have a look at slide number one. Now, remember, in this series of podcasts, what we're doing is we're focusing on uh, Stephen Avery and we're going through MAM 2. Well, in episode three, Kathleen Zona, uh, this is slide one, Kathleen Zona made several comments on the Steve Avery case. Now, remember, Stephen Avery is her client, and she was very, very scathing. Uh, she pulled no punches, and I quote, this is in regards to the Stephen Avery case. I quote, it is one of the all-time stupid cases. I cannot imagine how people put this together. And she's, of course, referring to Ken Kratz and uh, the prosecutorial team. But she also made a very interesting comment, and she stated, this can only be attributed to them, and by them she's referring to the jury, of not being given the evidence. And as you've noticed, in these podcasts, what we are doing is we're looking at the forensic evidence and how Kathleen Zona and her team of experts have broken that down. Now, of course, she is representing Stephen Avery. And at the time before he was arrested for the alleged murder of Teresa Orbach, Stephen Avery just happened to have a $36 million civil lawsuit uh, with the MTSO. Uh, the sheriff and the DA. And of course, he was, some, some people say, fortuitously arrested just before the sheriff and the DA were just about to give their depositions. And isn't it remarkable that the only person in the county who happened to have a lawsuit against the county just happened to be arrested for the murder of Teresa Hallbach, along with his nephew, Brendan Dassey. All right, but guys, here we're focusing on the forensic evidence. So let's have a look at slide number two. Now, remember, in one of our podcasts, in fact, in several of our podcasts, we discussed the importance of the Toyota RAV4 as an important crime scene. Well, equally as important and equally as critical was the other crime scene, and that was the Stephen Avery burn pit. The critical question here, guys, is as follows. Was the Stephen Avery burn pit the primary burn location? And as you know, Ken Kratz made a huge song and dance about the Stephen Avery burn pit, and he repeated it several times uh, during his summation, during his rebuttal. And he said, and I quote, Mr. Avery had a big whopping fire there on the 31st of October. And he said to the judge, he said to the jury, well, that was the only place that had a big whopping fire. There was no other place that had such a fire. So hence he was trying to convince everyone that the fire was only present in the burn pit. Nan's life, do you have a comment? Yes, he was actually gaslighting there because it didn't matter how tall the fire was. It doesn't create the uh, need of the heat to destroy the yes. bones. Yes, excellent, excellent. And we'll be covering that as well. But thank you, Nan's life. He had to convince the jury essentially that the only place in Manitowoc where there was a big whopping fire happened to be in Stephen Avery's burn pit. And as you can see here, uh, on the right-hand side, there's a picture of the burn pit, and we'll be discussing that because it actually is very, very critical. 
And you can see this is Stephen Avery's dog, Bear. And remember, Ken Kratz was trying to convince the jury and the judge that the reason why they couldn't find any bones any earlier or cremains any earlier was because Bear was such a vicious, nasty Alsatian dog and prevented all the investigators from approaching the burn pit. <laughs> right. So this is despite uh, there being dog handlers uh, on the premises. And of course, they could have easily got a family member to have removed Bear, but they didn't. They didn't. So the key critical question here, guys, is as follows. Was Teresa Horbach cremated in the burn pit? Okay, so let's have a look at slide number three. Well, 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 what do we have here? We have a star witness for the state, and in this case, it's Scott Tadich. And I quote, now remember, Scott Tadich, uh, his Brendan step was going to be Brendan's stepfather, um, and he's also Stephen's brother-in-law. Let me quote. Uh, this is during the Stephen Avery trial. Question. About 7.30 to 7.45, did you notice anything unusual around the property at that time? Answer. Yes, I did. Question. Can you tell the jury what you saw at that time, please? Answer, I saw a big fire. Question, all right, are you able to estimate from your observations how high or how tall the flames were as you were watching there about 7.45? Answer, they were almost as tall as the garage. All right, so, answer, eight, ten feet. I don't know, 10 feet maybe, 10 feet tall the flames were. Question, it was a big fire? Answer, it was a big fire. So now you can see, now remember, Ken Kratz talks to his witnesses first. So he would have coached them. He would have coached Scott to say certain things. Remember, it was up to Ken Kratz to convince the judge and the jury that Stephen Avery had a huge big whopping fire. And here we have a star witness who says he saw a big whopping fire. Well, if we have a look at slide number four, when he was questioned by the defense, all of a sudden Scott changed his tune. Because remember, Scott Tadich gave various interviews to law enforcement and of course, those were recorded, written down. And I quote, And is that the, if I understand, if I understood you today, you are telling us that when you see the fire later, sometime after 7.30, you think the flames were almost as high as the garage, maybe 8 to 10 feet? Answer, yeah. Question. Was November 29 also the day that you told the police that the flames were at least three feet high or at least that high? Answer, must, must have. Question, whenever you saw this fire and however many times you saw it, you smelled nothing strange coming from the fire? Answer, no. You heard no one screaming? No. You heard no gunshots? No. You didn't see Mr. Avery trying to conceal himself in any way? No. So as you can see here, all of a sudden that huge 8 to 10 feet fire was much smaller, more like around about 3 feet. So in a way, it negates what he was telling uh, Ken Kratz. But you see, it really depends whether the judge or the jury, who which statement they really believed in. But it was pretty obvious that initially, when Scott Tadich spoke to law enforcement, the flames were not 8 to 10 feet tall. And when you think about it, guys, uh, if there was a huge fire in the uh, burn pit, you're going to be in big trouble. First of all, there's the dog, Bear who would probably be burnt to a crisp. And there also happened to be a huge propane tank full of gas. 
and that likely would have been blown up as well. Also, remember that uh, Stephen Avery's sister used to com- Bob used to complain all the time when Stephen used to have fires that soot would appear on her house on the outside wall, and of course, no soot was seen. So clearly, it couldn't have been a big whopping fire. All right, now Kathleen Zellner, she obviously had gone through all the testimonies. And one of her focus areas was the Stephen Avery burn pit. So, guys, let's have a look at slide number five. Now, one thing that Kathleen Zellner does is that she hires the best of the best. So, Kathleen Zellner consulted with a forensic fire scientist. And in this case, his name is Dr. John Dahan. And Kathleen Zellner said of uh, Dahan, I quote, there isn't anybody in the world that knows more about burning bodies than he does. Dahan said, and I quote, and this is important, guys. I know what it takes to keep a body burning and what it takes to accomplish a certain amount of destruction. So he clearly knows what he's talking about. He's actually seen many uh, human cadavers burn, and what it takes to get to certain levels of destruction. And in this case, guys, we're dealing with total destruction, just bones remaining. All right, so let's turn to slide number six. Well, Dr. John Dahan looked at all the slides uh, and pictures regarding the Stephen Avery burn pit, and he came up with a whole series of issues regarding the burn pit. First of all, um, John DeHaan stated, this is an open pit. So that means that all the heat that you generate when you burn fuel is lost, predominantly lost to the atmosphere, right? So all the fire, all the heat predominantly is lost. And it means that if you want to keep that fire burning, You need to supply, (coughs) pardon me, you need to supply a lot of fuel to keep that fire burning. So you need a lot of fuel. He also stated that the size of the fire controls the height of the flames. So if Scott Taddish is talking about 8 to 10 feet high flames, you need a massive amount of fuel to have flames that high. But he reiterated a very important point. The actual pit is flat, relatively flat, which means the predominant amount of energy is going to be lost, lost to the surrounding atmosphere. And he stated, this is bad because you're not concentrating the fire next to the body, next to the cadaver. Now, he stated, yes, you'll definitely cause burning, but you're not going to get the level of destruction that we see um, that the state is trying to say occurred. So if you're going to burn a human body and break it down basically to bones, you need an enormous amount of fuel. You need a continuous amount of fuel all the time. All right, so guys, let's have a look at slide number seven. We know from uh, the photographs that tires were used as a source of fuel. And Dahan basically stated that the amount of tires used would not be sufficient to cause this level of destruction to a human being. And we can see on the right hand side the box of bones. So we know the sizes of the cremains. They're tiny. Some of them are around about a few inches or several centimeters in length. They were small. We, what we have here is complete destruction. There is no single bone. There is no one bone intact, like a rib, a femur, a pelvis, um, the skull, uh, the backbone. There's no bones which are intact. All the bones are broken down and crunched. 
So therefore, you, you know, or he knows, that there must have been a huge amount of energy uh, to basically break down a human being to this level of cremains. So Dahan summarized the following. When he looked at all the pictures of the burn site, the burn, Stephen Avery burn pit, he stated, there is no obvious fuel source. There is a lack of burnt debris. So if you're going to have a huge whopping fire, you need fuel, which means that you're going to have a lot of debris around and in the burnt pit. There wasn't any. Furthermore, when you burn a human body, I know it sounds disgusting, but you form a brown-black goo stain. That's due to your fat in your body. There was none of that. None was present. Furthermore, if you're burning a lot of fuel, you're going to have a high degree of ash. There wasn't any of that. So Dahan concluded that the Stephen Avery burn pit was not the primary burn site. And it's a real pity that the original defense didn't have these experts on hand. Nan's life. Do you have a comment? Yeah. Yes, and Ken Kratz always goes on about he burned tires, but equivalent the tires equivalent in that fire were no more than three. There are a lot of wires to make a tire. Correct. And so when you look at the photos, there's two, possibly three tires in that fire at one time. Correct. That's it. Correct. Correct you. Correct. Thanks, Nan's life. And look, there's no doubt, Dahan... Um, he would have done all reconstruction type of experiments. Um, and so they would have done burning of tires. They would have looked at different types of fuels, et cetera, et cetera. But it did make a very – so in other words, if you're going to burn a human body using tires, you need to keep on supplying tires all the time. There is no evidence of a huge number of tires. But he did make a very important comment. He stated that if gasoline was used uh, to burn a human body, what happens is the uh, solvent or gasoline uh, burns. Yes, it does. It cinders the body, but it eventually goes out, runs out and stops burning, which was really, really very interesting. But that's a very powerful conclusion from a professional who works in that field. And again, I want to reiterate, Dahan concluded this cannot be the primary burn site. There's simply no evidence for it. That is, there's no evidence that any human being was burnt in the burn pit, Stephen Avery burn pit. So guys, let's have a look at slide eight. So what I did is a summary slide. So we have here Stephen Avery's burn pit. And down below, we have the box of human cremains that allegedly were recovered from the Stephen Avery burn pit. And as you can see, the skeletal remains are completely fragmented and the entire skeleton was not recovered. Okay, that's important. I think up to 50, 60 percent of the skeletal remains are missing. Right. So these were the bones that were recovered, allegedly from Stephen Avery's burn pit. On the right hand side, what we see here is a, a crematorium, a human being uh, placed in a fire in a, in a crematorium. And as you can see here, the bones that are recovered after the burning episode, they're all small, they're all fragmented and they're highly calcined. They're whitish in appearance. But you can see that you have total destruction of a human being. There's nothing left but small, tiny bone fragments. I want to let you know that the temperature of the crematorium is around about 1,800 to 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. That's enormous. But in a crematorium, the important thing is this, guys, is that the heat is concentrated on the human body, right? It doesn't get dispersed into the atmosphere. It's concentrated inside. 
and you need a minimum of around about two hours to convert a human being into the following cremains. So it appears that the victim, Teresa Horbuck in this case, was cremated. So it needed a huge amount of temperature. It required many hours of sustained heat to convert a human body into that level of cremains. Dahan looked at the burn pit and said, there's no way you can convert a human being into bone fragments like that. All right, so let's have a look at slide number nine. Jack61, do you have a comment? Just remind me, Teresa's bones, just talking about the fires of the burn pit, Teresa, there was, or these bones didn't have any rubber residue on them. Is that That's correct, right? Uh, that's correct. Correct. Okay. Uh, uh, that's correct. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, uh, the, the bones themselves are very, very suspicious. Correct. Now, of course, um, if the bones were available to be re-examined, you would do microtrace analysis. You would have a look at the chemical composition of those bones and see if a particular accelerant was used, et cetera, et cetera. But unfortunately, as we know, guys, and as we know, um, listeners, how the bones were given back to the Hallbach family in 2011. Jack 61. So if they did re-examine or if they were able to, you know, put that under the and microtase could, could get them, they could see if there was any vulcanized rubber or that kind of thing Correct. embedded. Correct. Correct. That's what I thought. Correct. They, they would do scrapings of the bones put them in a mass spectrophotometer, any other analytical chemical uh, analysis, and have a look what's actually adhered to the bones, right? Whether it's rubber, uh, whether it's some other type of accelerant used, uh, potentially they could tell what has caused that level of destruction to the bones. Plus, if there's soil or dirt bacteria or whatever adhere to the bones, potentially they can work out where the primary burn site was located. Regrettably, the bones were given back. So it looks like a Kathleen Zellner's experts can't re-examine those bones anymore. All right, so guys, let's have a look at slide number nine. This is where the fundamental issue is, and that is where are the in-situ photographs? Uh, normally, what happens in a crime scene, uh, you photograph uh, every piece of evidence that you find, you document it, you log it in. There's one problem, <laughs> and that is there are no photographs of the discovery of the bones. And the obvious question is, why is that the case? Now, we know that Hundreds and hundreds of photographs have been released. There are photographs that have been withheld from release. But from what we've seen so far, you don't see any in situ bones being discovered in the burn pit. Zelna made the uh, comment, and this is so true, and I quote, the lack of documentation just speaks volumes about what was going on here in the effort to get Stephen Avery. Now remember guys, this is meant to be the primary burn location. Nothing is going to be more damaging to Stephen Avery if there are in situ photographs of the cremains from Teresa Horbach in that burn pit. Right? It's going to be very damaging, especially for his defense team to argue against it. But we don't find any. That's the main issue. The crime scene has not been properly documented at all. So, guys, let's have a look. And the other thing, of course, uh, listeners and panel, is that they did the same thing to the Toyota RAV4. It was not processed in situ at the salvage yard. It was taken away. All right, guys. So let's have a look at slide 10. Now, this truly is remarkable. And so this was an uh, email uh, from John Erdl 
to Tom Fassbender. Now, remember, Fassbender is the lead, one of the lead investigators in the case, right? And uh, Tom essentially asked John Erdl, okay, did you photograph the, the burn pit? Where are the photographs of the burn pit? I need to read this out because it truly is remarkable. Remember, uh, the state is saying that the burn pit is the primary burn location where Teresa Horbach was cremated. I read, I quote, Tom, I checked the contact prints of the photos we took at the scene and you are correct. There are none of the inside of the license plate vehicle and none of the burn pit. The reasoning is the same in both instances. We typically do not take photos to document a scene if the scene was knowingly being altered. In regards to the license plates, the fireman had reportedly unrolled at least one of the plates and they had been moved from the original positions. In regards to the burn pit, our involvement began with a request to use our sifting equipment. The scene had obviously been altered at that point. Had we been working any of these scenes from start to finish, there would likely have been a more thorough photo record. However, under the circumstances, we were merely able to provide technical assistance rather than complete scene processing. Uh, any, any evidence that we collected, including the license plates, was packaged by us, but inventorized, uh, inventorized, yeah, I think it was inventorized, and sealed by Calumet County, John Erdl. Now, if you're not yelling, screaming, and just tearing your hair out, nothing else will. Now, remember, you're meant to document a crime scene. You're meant to photograph, tag, record, what went on in the burn pit. Clearly, this did not take place. So, John was blaming Tom. Tom was blaming John. But what is clear here, someone had messed around with the burn pit. It had already been um, manipulated. It had been changed. So, John Erdl obviously would have come upon the uh, burn pit and said, what do you want me to photograph? Everything has been changed here. I personally believe that this was deliberately done. And to prove that, let's have a look at slide number 11, right? Now, you've all heard the famous uh, quote, and that is, ah, what do you need a coroner for? The coroner just comes along and kicks the body. Well, you can clearly see here, this is totally unbelievable. Heavy machinery, this is slide number 11, heavy machinery was used to dig up the burn pit, right? And the obvious question is, why are you using heavy machinery to dig out dirt from a burn pit if you suspect that's the primary burn location of Teresa Horbach? What are you going to achieve by destroying the um, scene of the crime? right? And by using heavy machinery, you are literally destroying the entire burn pit. Now, normally, of course, what would have happened under normal circumstances is the coroner comes along to the crime scene, kicks everybody up, brings her own team of forensic experts, and goes through the burn pit. And what normally will happen is that she would closely document all the findings in the burn pit. Well, the state did not tell um, the coroner about the burn pit. And in actual fact, they phoned her and threatened her that if she went on the Stephen Avery site, she would be arrested. Now, think about this, guys. The coroner had nothing to do with Stephen Avery in the past, right? So the state prevented uh, their own coroner for coming on board to examine the fire pit, the burn pit. Yet, you have people like Colburn, Lenk, Remaker, and a whole lot of other officers from the MTSO 
free to roam around the Stephen Avery, the salvage yard. So it just seems crazy that you don't want the coroner present. But I think we all know why they don't want the coroner present. Let's have a look at slide number 12. Well, here's the problem. If you've ever seen a crime show, you can see that when you properly document a burn pit or a place where a body is burnt or there are human remains or bones, you put a grid. You put a grid network around the uh, site, the crime scene, and you document every piece of bone or forensic evidence that you find. You don't use <laughs> heavy machinery to dig out dirt. Use brushes. Yes, it is time consuming, but the important thing is you don't disturb any of the cremains or bones or evidence which is present in that burn pit. If you use heavy machinery, you destroy the burn pit, right? So, no coroner, no person in charge, no in situ photographs. That is very, very damning. And of course, Kathleen Zellner will use that in her filings. Jack 61, do you have a comment? Isn't there uh, like a trail that they use? Uh, they call it something that they go, that's, that can only be allowed to use where you walk. I can't remember, can't remember what they call it. Yeah, I, I don't know th that, that piece of equipment, but you're correct. These um, forensic people, they're trained. They know how, it's like an archaeological uh, dig site. Um, they basically generate a 3D map of where all the cremains are found. Now, let's think about this, guys. If a human being, for example, Teresa Horbach, was burnt in the burn pit, no one is going to expect the skeletal remains to get up and walk and disappear, right? And not trying to be funny here, but basically the skeletal remains will be in situ where she was burnt. And of course, you document it, you take photographs, you carefully remove the cremains, and away you go. But you don't have any of this in this particular case, which is very, very highly suspicious. Okay, so no coroner, no proper documentation of the cremains. I completely agree with Bibi. Uh, we had this discussion many, many times <laughs> regarding those bones in a box. And uh, Bibi, do you want to say what you have always said in regards to those cremains? I think they came in the box and I think they left in the box. <laughs> yeah, correct. So thank you, Bibi. So really, the defense should have said, hey, we don't know the origins of these cremains. They could have come from anywhere. Show us where they actually came from. That should have been really stressed. All right, so let's have a look at slide number 13. Well, uh, Kathleen Zellner asked uh, Dr. Dahan, well, if the burn pit was not the primary burn site, where else can you burn a human body to the same degree that you see, in other words, bone fragments? Dr. Dahan stated that, hey, you can use a burn barrel, and in actual fact, he's uh, examined cases in which people were burnt in a burn barrel, and he made the comment that he was rather surprised. He said that burning a human being in a burn barrel, I quote, was surprisingly effective. The reason why it's surprisingly effective is because you have a metal container. The heat is reflected back onto the body, just like you get in a crematorium. So you can concentrate the heat uh, on the uh, body part that you're trying to burn. Now, we know that through forensic investigation of the bones, um, Teresa Horbach was cut up to pieces into smaller fragments. So therefore, it's going to be much easier to burn uh, body parts as opposed to burning an entire human body. So it's going to be much more efficient. So if you're burning um, 
parts of a human, I know this is horrible to talk about, but if you're only looking at an arm or a leg or whatever, it's going to be easier to burn rather than a whole human body. There are cut marks on the bones, right? Sore cut marks. There's no question that Teresa Horbach, unfortunately, well, the whole thing is unfortunate and horrendous. She was dismembered and cut up to pieces, right? So it's going to be much easier to burn those remains in a burn in a burn barrel. To my shock and horror, um, this guy um, on YouTube um, showed that you can actually form what's known as a turbo burn barrel. And that is all you need to do is supply the burn barrel with oxygen, just oxygen. And it burns extremely, extremely hot. The other important thing is, is that the burning was virtually smokeless. So it burned very intensely um, with just oxygen. So you didn't need a huge supply of fuel. And what this guy did that built the burn barrel, the turbo burn barrel, was that if you dropped oil, it got a boost. So it, it, the flame went really high, increased in heat. And of course, such high temperatures, localized high temperatures, will be sufficient to cremate a human being. Of course, uh, John DeHaan, he's done all these experiments before. He's seen cases where humans have been burnt in burn barrels. Okay. So let's have a look at slide number 14. So the burn barrel potentially is another burn site or location, not necessarily the burn pit. So if we have a look at slide number 14, what we see here is that there were four burn barrels known as the yonder burn barrels that, that were labeled one to four, and these were seized on November the 6th. And what happened was these burn barrels, especially burn barrel number two, let's follow burn barrel number two. Burn barrel number two, this is yonder burn barrel number two, was examined on the 7th and the 8th. No bones were found in yonder burn barrel number two. However, on November the 12th, the uh, investigators re-examined yonder burn barrel number two. Lo and behold, bones were now found. Human cremains were now found in yonder burn barrel number two. And what Kathleen's um, team found was that the same individuals that found the bones in yonder burn barrel number two, they had gone to the deer camp previously. So it's rather remarkable that initially when the burn barrel was examined, no bones were found. Uh, on the 12th, now bones were discovered in yonder burn barrel number two, which is very, very interesting indeed. How do you account for that? Let's have a look at slide number 15. So quite clearly here, guys, what is happening and a lot of, I think, moving on has done a lot of excellent research regarding the burn barrels and also uh, other YouTubers as well, other researchers. Clearly, there is a shell game going on here, right? You can't have a burn barrel with no bones, examine it several days later, and all of a sudden you find human remains, right? Which is crazy. So some type of shell game or swapping of labels or burn barrels was going on uh, with burn barrel number two. If we have a look at slide number 15, well, when the investigators went to the deer camp, now remember, we have um, scent dogs, we have cadaver dogs all around this area here. And a scent dog, I believe by the name of Loof, Lo and behold, hit on one of the burn barrels at the deer camp. Now, remember, the scent dog 
is pre-scented with Teresa Horbach's scent. Uh, I believe in this case it was from a shoe. What on earth is a scent dog hitting on a burn barrel at the deer camp? Right, and as you can see, you can see the location of the deer camp from Stephen Avery's trailer. If Teresa Horbach, according to the state, was killed and burnt in Stephen Avery's burn pit, what is a scent dog doing giving a strong hit at a burn barrel at the deer camp? It clearly does not make any sense whatsoever. So guys, let's have a look. So that was very, very interesting and very damaging. I don't think the defense pushed these points hard enough. They really should have spent more time talking about uh, the scent and cadaver dogs and what they found. And of course, uh, McGilla uh, has done excellent research regarding uh, the dogs and the tracks. So, superb piece of research. Okay, so if we have a look at slide number 16, here's the problem, and I totally agree with BB. On the 8th, all of a sudden, cremains were allegedly found in Stephen Avery's burn pit. But here's the problem where is the evidence that the bones in the box came from Stephen Avery's burn pit? There isn't any. Now, remember, these bones that were in a box, Dr. Bennett saw them and examined them. He didn't know where they come from. They just handed him a box with bones. He wasn't there. When he examined the bones, he found a pelvic bone, right? And from that, he was able to ascertain that it had come from a human female around about 30 years of age. So he was able to look at one of the pelvic fragments and say, yep, this is from a female, right? So it's remarkable that from observing those bones, those bone, the pelvic bone is called a diagnostic bone. You'll be able to, uh, someone who's a forensic anthropologist can look at that bone and say, yes, it's from a male or it's from a female of a certain age. Now, remember, Dr. Eisenberg didn't see those bones, I think it was, until the 10th. And she was quizzed about this. And she was asked, well, were you on the salvage yard when these bones were collected? No, I wasn't. So what are you relying upon? Basically, the honesty of the law enforcement officers that found the human cremains. So in other words, if they said to her, these were from the Stephen Avery burn pit, she just accepted it, right? There's no paper trail to say exactly where these human cremains had come from. And again, if we look at what the state is trying to do, it is smoke and mirrors. You've got bones in a box. You don't really know the origin of where those bones, human cremains, had come from. So that's very important. And I agree with BB. Came in a box left in a box. No one knows where these cremains had come from. Have a look at all those bone fragments. There's plenty of them. We should have 50, 60, maybe 100 photographs of the burn pit with those human cremains. We don't have any as far as I'm aware. All right. So guys, let, oh, and Nan's life. Do you have a question? Yes. Not only do we have bones in a box, but we have bones Ziploc bags. So we don't know if the bones in the box are human or not human. They're mixed. But why why are those bones specifically in bags? <laughs> right. Well, the bones which are in the plastic bags are the ones that were examined by Bennett and also by Dr. Eisenberg. The bones that are in that bag, and I remember reading it in the testimonies, that's where the pelvic bone is. Right. So uh, Dr. Bennett obviously looked at the cremains, uh, was able to sort them out and found a diagnostic pelvic bone. Remember, there also has to be cranial bone fragments in there as well. Nan's life. Right. So he looked at the bones, sorted them and then put them in a bag. And then they left the box of bones 
by the door for Eisenberg for when she correct. returns out of town. Correct. That is okay. Correct. Okay. That is correct. That is correct. So Dr. Bennett looked at them first, uh, and he looked at the uh, pelvic bone, and he was able to ascertain that it came from a human female. But note this, guys, when Dr. Eisenberg, and we'll talk about this in a later podcast, when Dr. Eisenberg examined the bones, she didn't use the pelvic bone to determine that it was from a female. She used other bones and just did not even look at the pelvic bone, which was very, very interesting. She looked at uh, a bone above the ridge of the eye uh, and looked at a particular notch and was able to ascertain that it had come from a female, which is rather crazy because if you've got a, a pelvic bone, that's the obvious bone of choice that you use because a pelvis is different in shape from a female to a male. But you're right. Where did all the other cremains come from? You just don't know. And one thing you don't do, right? And even, I mean, you can imagine a coroner looking at that box of bones. One thing you don't do is mix the bones, right? And we know, guys, we know that bones, human cremains, were found allegedly in the burn pit, in yonder burn barrel number two, and also in the Manitowoc County Gravel Pit. So are all the bones mixed together? If that's the case, this is extremely sloppy scientific work. You just simply do not mix the bones together. Very, very bad. All right, guys, let's turn to slide number 17. Well, lo and behold, something big happened. This was on November the 7th, right? And as you can see, there is a lot of vehicles around uh, the end of Cuss Road. And at the end of Cuss Road, uh, the investigators found a suspect burial site. In fact, it was found by uh, some searchers, right? They must have informed law enforcement. And they went down there, and they obviously went down there in droves, right? It wasn't one or two officers. It was a huge number of resources that went down there. Now, as we know, um, uh, a retired officer by the name of Bushman, who came out of retirement, just happened to coordinate the searches down Cuss Road. So there was a lot of activity that was happening at Cuss Road. Now, I want you to look at this picture slide 17. You can see that there is a back passage running from Cuss Road directly to Stephen Avery's property. That field allegedly is a corn field, right? But you can see a dirt track and a berm on the other side that runs between Cuss Road to Stephen Avery's trailer. So this suspected burial site was found on November the 7th. So let's have a look at slide number 18. Well, lo and behold, a cadaver dog, and I believe also the scent dog, hits at the suspect burial site at Cuss Road. Apparently, Luth, who's the scent dog, was not permitted to cross the yellow tape. Now think about this, guys. You've got a suspected burial site. You've got a scent dog giving a hit at the suspect burial site, but you're not allowing Loof to investigate any further, which is rather bizarre because surely you're interested in what's happened at this so-called suspect burial site. But no, they prevented Loof from venturing in to the suspect burial site. This photograph on slide 18 is superb because it shows you the location of Cuss Road, the suspect burial site, the deer camp, and the side road that takes you to the deer camp. But it also shows you that on November the 8th, a cadaver dog hit at around Stephen Avery's trailer. And Kathleen Zellner made the point. You can easily bring material 
from Cuss Road, a suspect burial site, back and forth between uh, Cuss Road and Stephen Avery's trailer. And remember, uh, and uh, McGilla has done a lot of extensive uh, research on this, there's a trail by the dogs that go up and down that side um, uh, where the cornfield is, and uh, there's hot spots around the boom. Now think about it, guys. If Teresa Horbach never left the Avery Salvage Yard, why are the dogs hitting outside of the Avery Salvage Yard? doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Now, to me, if we look at slide number 19, this is truly remarkable. And that is, there obviously was a helicopter flying above Cuss Road. And the helicopter was there for the majority of the day because we have photographs during the day and of the night of the suspect burial site. So that was an area of intense scrutiny, intense investigation. Now, Andrew Colburn, he went to the suspect burial site twice, once in the morning and he got called back in the late afternoon, both him and Link. Now, I quote, first of all, you can see the number of vehicles and resources that were around Cuss Road, around the suspect burial site. You can see the crime scene tape. It was big. They taped off a huge area. They also blocked the roads. They clearly did not want anyone coming in and coming out. And you can see I've labelled the cars and the vehicles red arrows. There were plenty of them. There was an ambulance down there. The crime scene lab was down there. And Lord knows how many other investigators. Anyway, this was November the 7th. Anyway, Colburn was questioned by Ken Kratz. And I quote, This is something that Mr. Erdl yesterday talked about, a potential burial site. But what wasn't? Was that your understanding that it turned out not to be? Yes, it turned out to be nothing. And guys, that was it. That was the end of the discussion of Cuss Road. No, no further discussion was uh, entered into. And according to uh, the people that were there, it was simply merely a, a, a dead tree stump. You know, there was a bit of disturbed soil. Nothing to see here, guys. No problems whatsoever. Except, of course, the investigators put up lighting. Uh, and illuminated the whole area, and they put a blue tarp on top. So that's what you call proper forensic investigation, whereby there's a whole team of experts down there, and they obviously took a lot of photographs. Uh, we've only seen a portion of them, and the ones I want to see are the photographs in the batch H1 and H2, where they mention body, dig site, measurement. So it'll be very interesting to see what actually was found in that temporary burial site. It can't be just a tree stump. There's no way you're going to have all this amount of resources for a burial site. You look at it, examine it, nothing to see here, boys. Let's go. They spent all day, and I believe on the 8th as well. Clearly something of significance was found there. And the fact that the dogs hit around that area including the deer camp, proved to me that something of huge significance was found, but it's been suppressed. All right, guys, let's have a look at slide number 20. Well, you can see here that a huge area uh, around, at the end of Cuss Road was taped off. But if you have a look at the bottom left-hand corner, it's small, but you can see this metal rod uh, inside uh, uh, a guy holding that metal rod. Well, these were the guys that surveyed in 3D. They mapped that entire area, right? Part of the uh, thing was Trooper Austin. They mapped that entire area. Now, think about this, guys. What on earth are they bothering wasting money and time 
uh, doing a map of all the area if nothing of significance occurred there, right? And what is damning, of course, is both scent and cadaver dogs had alerted in this area. Furthermore, uh, Sheriff Pagel prevented Loof from crossing that yellow tape, right? But if a dog, if a scent dog is giving a hit, that's definitely very suspicious, definitely something of significance had been found there. But Ken Kratz, I think he spent 20 seconds talking about the events of Cuss Road as well. But in summary, guys, it's clear that something big was found there. All right, guys, let's move along to slide 21. We're nearly finished, guys. As you can see, these are pictures of Cuss Road uh, around the deer camp. And we know that Luth, who's a scent dog, went from Cuss Road right and circled the deer camp. And this deer camp belonged to Rodont. He's the owner of the quarry. But very interestingly, the dog did a hit on the burn barrel, right? So this whole area is very, very important and highly suspicious. That you've got a scent dog following the trail from Cuss to the deer camp and then doing a hit on the burn barrel. Remembering, of course, what it found, apparently found in yonder burn barrel number two. It's very, very likely that whatever was found in the burn barrel at the Redont property either was transposed to yonder burn barrel number two or they just simply changed the labels, right? Something fishy had gone on. So, guys, let's have a look at slide 22. Now, if you think that was the end of it, it wasn't. It got worse. What was discovered was that pelvic bones were found in the Manitowoc County gravel pit. And this slide, this is slide number 22. So, one can now see you've got the dogs doing a hit on the burn barrel at the deer camp. You've got uh, the location of Stephen Avery's trailer, and lo and behold, you find uh, pelvic bones in the Manitowoc County gravel pit. And there were several mounds of bones found at the Manitowoc County gravel pit. I think there were three, three mounds containing bone fragments. Now, Dr. Eisenberg, and we'll discuss this in another podcast, Dr. Eisenberg, refused to call them human. She called them suspect possible human because had she made the determination that they were human bones, how was anyone going to explain why part of a human pelvis was allegedly found uh, in the Stephen Avery burn pit and the other part of the pelvis was found in the Manitowoc County gravel pit? It made no sense. So, was the gravel pit or around the quarries, was that where she was burnt? Teresa Horbach was burnt. Was she burnt in a burn barrel at the deer camp? And were her cremains dumped elsewhere? Right? That's what it send, tends to suggest. But again, uh, Dr. Eisenberg refused to classify those cremains as being of human origin, yet they had cut marks and they were burnt to the same degree as the other cremains. And when all the bones were examined, Dr. Eisenberg said, we have one victim, right? There were no duplicate bones found, which makes it highly, highly likely we're talking about one victim here. Okay. So, guys, let's have a look at slide 23. We're nearly done. Kathleen Zellner explained uh, the requirements that you need for a Denny suspect. Now, guys, we already know that the defense in the Stephen Avery trial, they were hobbled. They weren't allowed to point their finger at anybody else during the trial. This was very, very frustrating. Now, the requirements for a Denny suspect are relatively simple. 
you need to show someone had the motive, the opportunity, and had a direct connection to the crime, right? And I think most of the panel and most of the listening audience are probably jumping up and down, and they've got at least three or four potential Denny suspects. And as Kathleen Zellner said, you raise doubt. You do that by pointing the finger to somebody else. And of course, this is precisely her tact during if she can get an evidentiary hearing. And that is to name potential Denny suspects. All right, guys, our final slide. Now, this was very, very interesting indeed. This is slide number 24. Now, as we know, as we know, a lot of the action took place at Josh Redon's quarry and deer camp, right? A lot of activity. The law enforcement were down there. The investigators were down there. The dogs were down there. Obviously, they found a lot of things at the quarry and at the deer camp and the burn barrel. Now, Josh Redon wrote something very, very interesting. Look at the date, the 5th of November, right? This is the day where the RAV4 was found at the Avery Salvage Yard. This was the date when nobody knew where Teresa Hobart was. The only thing that was found was her vehicle. Lo and behold, Josh Redon wrote this report or gave this statement, and I quote, uh, on about on October the 31st, at approximately 4.30 p.m., I drove up to my deer camp off, off Cuss Road um, through my gravel pit uh, and observed, now note, and observed a fire going in the proximity of Stephen Avery's home or on Avery property. The fire, now note this, the fire appeared to be contained to a 55-gallon drum, right? And what the investigators did, they took a camera and they went to where Josh Redon made this observation. And as you can see here, uh, you can see some of the buildings on the Avery Salvage Yard, but there'll be no way you can make a definitive statement by saying, oh, yeah, there was a fire in a 55-gallon drum. Kathleen Zellner made a very important comment, and that is, I quote, Josh Redont was the first person to link Stephen Avery to the crime, which is rather remarkable. And in further podcasts, we'll be looking at Josh Redont uh, very, very closely. All right, guys, we've managed to go through the podcast. Let's open it up to the panel. Let's open it up to the audience. Thank you, guys. Jack sixty one. Didn't they? Um, did Wendy or actually not just her, but weren't there several uh, officers that guarded Redon's barn barrel overnight? Uh, I believe that's the case. Correct. Correct. I, I uh, it's hard to believe, Jack, why they just simply didn't take it immediately. I don't know. I don't know that one, but correct. Yes, apparently it was guarded. Okay, guys, any other further comments? Neverly. Hi, Dr. Selkman. In regards to the number two burn barrel. Yes. Kathleen Zellner's intern, I forgot her name, really cute girl. So she said um, she was researching that and she said the number two barrel was um, when it was found, it was searched and nothing was found. And then for some unknown reason, it was it searched is. the second time. Correct. And boom, there were the bones. After going to the deer camp. That is correct. That is correct. Yeah. Uh, and, and who was in charge yeah. of that? The two okay. same agents, correct? That is correct. The same two guys, but the same two agents I don't know then. I know it's in case so. Uh, the same two guys went to the deer camp uh, and then searched Young the Burn Barrel number two, and lo and behold, uh, human bones were found in it. These bones I think were. She's... Yes? Sorry. 
No, no, keep Sorry. going. Uh -huh. I think she said it was a uh, Colburn, of course, Lang. They're like, you know, joint of the hip and Tyson. Yes, I, I can't remember the name of the agents at this stage. It's in Queso, though. But you're correct, Neverly. It is very, very suspicious. Jack? I think it, I'm also remembering as they went through and they did this sifting, they re it again. And then some of it, they re it again after that. And, and as each time they sifted, it, they found more stuff. Yes. Yes. Like the uh, rabbit, like the, the uh, Daisy yes. Fuentes. Yes. Correct. So how, how could that, I'm just saying, how could that be missed, you know, at the outset? You know, how, how do you miss this? Just like other than downsizing the screens. Ugh. Yes. Yes. I mean, that's a very good point, Jack. I mean, you, you would expect proper documentation. You'd expect there to be a video. Uh, you'd expect to be photographs of all the findings. There's no point in having a photograph of what you found right at the end because you don't know the um, a chain of command, basically, where the, where the evidence had come from. But clearly, uh, when, the, uh, when they searched Bur Yonder Burn Barrel Number 2, nothing was found. And remember, Ken Kratz said that it was Stephen Avery who put larger bones in yonder burn barrel number two. If that's the case, how could the investigators miss the so-called larger bones? It makes no sense. Beverly, do you have a comment? Yes, Dr. Silverman, I have a question and then a comment. The question is, what are we talking about the larger bones? How large are we? We're talking about, about <laughs> we're, we're talking about several inches. Yeah. Um, remember, all these bone fragments were actually quite small. Most mm -hmm. of them were about the size of your thumbnail. They were tiny. Mm -hmm. um, and Dr. Eisenberg said that, uh, now believe this or not, after cremation, the bones were crunched. So not only, not only was um, Teresa Hallbach uh, cremated, she, the, the, the cremains were crunched with something obviously heavy. So they were broken down to tiny, tiny fragments. Um, some of the fragments were the sizes of the thinness of a match. They were tiny. BB. Or like they do in a crematorium. Correct. Smash Correct. Them and grind them. Correct. Uh, if you've ever seen um, someone being cremated, like a video, of course, uh, what they do is at the end of the cremation, they get a big metal bar and they crunch the bones because some of the bones are very, very hard to break. They use a metal pole and they crunch the skull uh, and other larger bones that have remained. And then after the bones are crunched, they're put through a cremulator. Basically, they're ground down to a powder. Yeah. So these bones have been crunched. Sammy, do you have a comment? Bean Green asked uh, in the chat, what do you think happened to her teeth? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. I can't answer it because uh, teeth, uh, and anyone who's got medical experience um, can back me up on this, uh, teeth are very difficult to burn, uh, completely burn. And in actual fact, they've used teeth in forensic analysis, A, to identify the individual, and B, to extract DNA from because teeth are very, very hard. Where, also, the, where the teeth are, that's a really good question. Yeah. Sammy. We haven't a clue. Uh, Jamie Hart also asked, he said, Silkman, would bodily fluids help extinguish a small fire? Uh, bodily fluids? No. I mean, if you're burning, for example, if you're burning a human body, Everything will vaporize. Those very, very high temperatures vaporize. Now, remember, he said a small fire. So well, uh, small, yeah. he's yeah. Theor if they theorizing. Were, if they were fat, if they were a fat person with the fat wick, um, like wax. Um, yes. Yeah. It, it would take more than a small fire. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Dr. De, Dr. DeHaan obviously has seen human formations uh, take place. 
uh, and also some of the um, uh, burnings that happened in places like India. And so he would have been, he would have had firsthand knowledge of the amount of fuel you need to cremate a human body and what happens to a human body. Clearly, you need a lot, a lot of fuel. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. That's that's what not was found in Stephen Avery's nope. burn pit. All uh, right. One yes. more question from the chat. One more question. T1 asked, where's the evidence that Stephen Avery had any sophistication or prior knowledge of how to dispose of a body or crime sense in such a way? No web searches, no library records, not one jail convo conversation no no no, no, none whatsoever you have to be you have to be you have to be um you definitely have to know your stuff on if you're going to cremate somebody to um the state that the bones were found you need to know what you're doing um it's just not hey let's build a little fire here and we're going to burn a victim yes you end up burning a victim but um the body will remain where it is We've all unfortunately seen photographs of victims that have been burnt in fires. Uh, you can see um, that the skeletal or partial remains, uh, you can see the outline of the person. Here, you saw nothing but tiny bone fragments. It's like she was cremated elsewhere or burnt elsewhere, and the bones were transported to either the salvage yard or the burn barrel doesn't make any sense uh, so essentially the um, burn pit cannot be the primary burn location all right guys any other questions Neverly. there is actually a question um, that super mario asked is it known if the body showed any signs of knowledge in cutting it up uh you mean the body itself is it known if the body showed any signs of knowledge in cutting it up? In other words, like an experienced person. This marrow mud. Is that well, what you well, meant? Yeah, I mean, I mean, the, well, the um, wouldn't sorry, it be know because they cut off the hip bone like in a really weird place. Well, that's true. That's true. Um, but you would have to, you would have to have knowledge and skill to dismember a human body. Do you uh, mind the... if I interject? No, not at all. Um, first of all, so very little of the remains were found that there's no way to know for sure. And I can tell you from being a meat cutter for five years that when you're skilled at it, you know exactly what part of the joint to cut to get things yes. to separate and it yes. is not difficult if you know what you're doing as far as to cut up an animal um to debone it i mean the whole nine yards but i'm gonna say you're not gonna get away with cutting something up like that and and taking it piecing it out without leaving some kind of cut marks at some point you know yes yes but so little of the body was found for there to anyone to be able to determine that. Uh, correct. But what was found, uh, thank you, Sammy, but what was found were there were fine blade cuts in the bones and also a kerf saw blade. So uh, Teresa Hobart was cut up probably with um, uh, either a knife or a hacksaw, something to cut up the body into smaller fragments. It doesn't appear to have been like an axe because of the way the uh, bones had the, they're called hesitation cut marks. Basically, you start to hack into or cut into the bone and then you stop. But clearly, someone was using fine blades to cut the body up into pieces. Uh, Jack 61. Go back to slide 11. And the digging out of the pit. Yes. Do you think that do you think that they foresaw it being a problem that and we know that the fatty, all these remains ooze down into the soil so that no one could come back later and dig around in the soil and say, Hey, there's none of that here. And they just scooped it all out. 
Well, the thing is, if they were doing proper crime scene documentation, that were, <laughs> which they obviously didn't, no, before no. you before you bring even a shovel, you take pictures of the surface of the burn pit and close ups. Yep. Uh, you examine it. You look for th obvious things like clothing, uh, jewelry, or whatever. Uh, human cremains, uh, the black ooze, ash. Uh, they found none of that. Right? Otherwise, if they did, there would have been photographs. Uh, Jack, the last thing you do, and you know as much as I do, you never disturb uh, a dig site using that heavy machinery. Right? I think, unless, I think, you're, right. Un, 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 unless you're looking for gold. You you don't disturb a crime scene like that. In actual fact, what they've done is destroyed the crime scene. So therefore, think about this. If you're going to do a switcheroo and say, oh, yeah, we found these bones at the Stephen Avery burn pit and somebody else wanted to come along and reanalyze the burn pit, you say, oops, we dug it all out. So, therefore, if you destroy the crime scene, you've uh, covered your tracks. And that's precisely what they've done. They dug it out and put the dirt in mounds, and then they sifted through the dirt. Now, you don't know that the cremains that were found, what did they find? Did they find chicken bones, animal bones? You don't know. So, it's like an illusion. You have a box of bones, and you say, yeah, they came from over here, but you can't prove it. Jack. Or in what or in what order what order they found because they didn't dig it properly they didn't sift it layer by layer by layer like you said correct correct uh, anybody who's uh, processing a crime scene uh, would be flabbergasted to see what they did to that burn pit right now think about it you've got a human body that allegedly was burnt in that burn pit. Uh, by using uh, hand tools, you'll be able to dig out every bone. You'll find them all. You don't need to dig it out like this. To me, I reckon they've done this to destroy the crime scene so no one can come back and reanalyze it. BB. Well, and it's not really a burn pit. It's a burn area before they get at it with that bobcat. Correct, correct. Uh, what Dahan said, thank you, Bibi. What Dahan said was that the burn pit was flat. Uh, what we get said to, uh, to Brendan Dassey, hey, look, the burn pit's a few feet by a few feet. It's about the size of a tabletop. It was not huge. It was not big. Uh, there was no way that you can sustain a massive fire in that burn pit. And that was important. And Neverly, do you have a question? Yeah, I was actually going to say exactly that, that he said that the burn pit was flat. We already know that somebody testified that it was a size of roughly of a table. Yes. So you cannot put a body in there, like Brendan said, or who's ever in imagination, and that you Correct. would need hundreds of gallons to keep the fire burning. And he said that actually the gasoline, if you squirt like a, a ton of gasoline on the body that there would be a huge combustion everything would go up in the air it would correct. towards the body but it would also put it out put the fire Cor out co correct correct so uh dahan th thank you neverly so dahan was basically saying if you're going to cremate if you're going to cremate a human body you need a constant constant source of fuel if you burn a lot of fuel you're going to have a lot of debris so, therefore, if you look at a burn pit, which they did, they looked at the photographs that were available, they immediately came to the conclusion, hey, there's not enough fuel here. Uh, there's not enough ash. There's no black goo. There was nothing that you would typically find uh, in an area that required a huge amount of fuel and a burning, a high degree of burning. So nothing about the burn pit made any sense. So, guys, think about this. The Toyota RAV4 did not make any sense as a crime scene. The burn pit didn't make any sense at all. All the interesting findings at Cuss Road were suppressed. So what does that tend to suggest? It tends to suggest that it's smoke and mirrors. They gave the illusion of a crime having taken place 
in the Toyota RAV4 and in the burn pit, but it's not supported by the forensics. It's not supported by the observations and the mechanics of burning a human being. It doesn't make any sense. Guys, do we have any further questions? Neverly. Yeah, well, um, just in regards to the fire, the size of the fire, how... Uh... Kratz wanted to be so slick and not slick actually he was being nefarious when he talked um what's his name Tadic to say that Tadic. it was a big whopping fire right as Correct. tall as the garage and here that's what Kratz says one Kratz right he relies Correct. on Scott's uh, uh testimony like that's really credible and then you have one John Dehan you know, Correct. the forensic fire scientist who says that, you know, the size doesn't even really matter. It's Correct. the longevity of the fire that says. Co and Zahner Correct. is getting really upset and she's disappointed. She's upset. She's just in disbelief that, uh, and she calls it one of these all time stupid cases. That's and that Correct. basically they were, as you said, withholding evidence. And then Colburn has. On the stand, he says, no photo evidence of the discovery of the bones. There's nothing to see there. And then Correct. we have cadaver dogs alerting at the, uh, what do you call it, at a deer camp. Us, at and deer no camp. one Correct. follows up. So she was upset Correct. with the defense. Right, for so. Correct. Correct. In fact, she's going to use it as in ineffective assistance to counsel. So, yeah, it's going to be very, very bad. Spooky 67. Thank you, I, Neverly. Um, I was just thinking about Scott when he talked about how the flames were taller than the garage. And Correct. There, Bears, the dog, the German Shepherd, yes. his house yes. and his, he's chained to that location. He would be able yes. even stand, he'd have no fur. He would just be smoking. Singed. <laughs> <laughs> yes, correct, correct. Hair, a hairless German Shepherd, uh, the one correct. with the Lazla. Correct. Yeah, and, he uh, would just be like smoldering, walking around, barking. Correct, correct. And uh, the, the whole the whole thing is crazy, right? Because uh, as Dehan said, where's where's the evidence of the ash? Right. So you would find ash distributed everywhere on the garage wall, on the dog kennel on Barb's house because you've got all this thick black smoke that is occurring as a result of burning, you don't find any of that. And so that's why a Kathleen Zona is reliant on experts in various fields. Unfortunately, the defense did not do that. So all you have to have is a comment by uh, the star witness, Scott Tadich. All you have to have is a comment from Colburn saying, yep, nothing to see here. And so what you do is you shut off uh, lines of inquiry. And that clearly was a disaster for Stephen back then. But now Kathleen Turner can present all of this, hopefully to a judge. Sammy, do you have a comment? Yep. Yeah, T1 asked, he said off topic, was Brenda Dassey, or is it Bobby, shown on the video by... FB oh F, FB and Weigert at Fox Hill. Fact, fact Bender reports to BD. Replay the tape or video in your head, Brandon. So it's yeah. Brandon Dassey. Yeah, yeah. Uh, look, I, 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 both myself and Bron did a whole video uh, presentation about play that video in your head. We believe he had seen the film Kiss the Girls. And in the scene of Kiss the Girls, there actually are images of victims in fire, right? And so when Brendan Dassey uh, gave his so-called coerced confession, he said that both him and Stephen uh, picked up Teresa's body. He picked them up by the feet and uh, Stephen picked them up by the shoulder, her by the shoulder, and they threw her onto the fire. But note... Brendan Dassey never mentioned the fact that she was cut up in pieces. That's straight away. The investigators straight away should have known that what Brendan was telling him, telling them, was completely false. They absolutely was no... knew it. They absolutely knew it. Correct, Jack. There was no basis in what he was telling them. 
And if you remember from last week's podcast, well, 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 when they asked uh, Brendan, okay, how did you get the RAV4 down there to the pit? He said that he drove past his mother's house, uh, Dolores's house, Chucky's house, past the crusher and into the pit. Well, guess what? There are no dog tracks there, right? You think about it. The Toyota RAV4 would have had fresh blood from Teresa Horbach, and it drove right around the perimeter to the pit. All the dogs are off the salvage yard, predominantly off the salvage yard. And not only that, but Fassbender told Stephen Avery exactly where the Toyota RAV4 had come from. And correct me if I'm wrong, but the investigators also told Josh Redont <laughs> that the Toyota RAV4 came through his property, right? So it came from the quarry deer camp area, not around the perimeter where Brendan said. The investigators knew. The investigators knew that everything Brendan was saying to them was not based on fact, right? And yet they still went with it. Uh, Neverly, a quick question. Yeah, I'm just going to quote Zellner. I mean, she was on fire in this episode. And she said that... <laughs> on fire. <laughs> she was, on yes. fire. Oh, okay. Well, anyway, so she was, um, I can't even say hot, on point. She said that yes. um, their theory is idiotic, that the crime makes no sense according to their theory, and that the criminal is documenting what they're doing. She was actually referring Correct. to the police reports. To the police. Correct. Unbelievable. She's so Correct. good at lover. Correct. Oh, look, um, Stephen, thank you, Neverly. Uh, it's clear that Stephen has one of the best uh, attorneys that you can get. But the important thing here, guys, is what we've been documenting in our podcast. She has deconstructed the evidence. She has deconstructed the forensic evidence and exposed it for the rubbish that it really is. Now, the question is, how come Stephen's defense team was not able to do the same? That's the critical thing. Whereas Zellner's approach is, okay, I'm going to destroy the state's case. The defense partially did, but did not go far enough. All right, guys, are there any other questions? Any other comments? We're looking good. We're looking good. We're looking good. So, guys, uh, if everyone is happy, uh, I think we're approaching two hours. Uh, if there are any further questions, please write them down and see if we can answer them uh, during a time. Um, guys, are there any final comments? Any final comments? Bibi, any final comments? Uh, just, I gotta, I gotta say it. The oh, chicken no. wing. The chicken yeah, the wing. Chicken. Eisenberg and the bird box. Eisenberg. Correct, correct. Uh, yes. Uh, she clearly screwed it up in the Christine Rudy case. And she did, she did. Yes, correct. and there was clearly a chicken wing and you never once hear anybody call out. I most like, certainly would have I, if I was a defense, I most certainly would have questioned her credibility and her competence after that. Correct. Well, and never Correct. once does she call out, oh, yeah, there was a box of bones and like one chicken wing. Okay. Yeah, I, one I, okay, okay even I could tell it's a chicken wing. All right. Um, Moving on and is asking Dr. Silkman, do you know of any new technology that a bone could be analyzed to tell if a person was pregnant? Mm, not that I'm aware of. No, because that would not. require them to be able to find that uh, hormone, right? Yes, but also whether you you would really have to consult with um, an anthropologist and with someone who's an expert at anatomy whether pregnancy can cause uh, changes to bone structure and bone morphology. That I don't know. Um, but clearly, here's the problem, right? Um, if you cremate a human body, you remove everything, right? You're not going to know. You're not going to know what happened to that person. Clearly, there's no muscle. Uh, clearly, there's no 
a tissue that could be tested. But, of course, there was blood in the RAF4. Whether any type of analysis could have been done, um, type of chemical analysis that could have been done looking for trace hormone levels, I don't know. But I, I dare say that it's probably too late now. It's probably too late uh, because you cremate a human body basically to hide, uh, if it's a, a criminal case, to hide what happened to that person. But clearly, uh, the the also the purpose of the cremation is to destroy the identity of that person, and it's only by a miracle that some muscle tissue was found. Uh, that they did the DNA testing. Yes, they only got seven loci coming up. Correct. BB is correct. You can't say it's definitively Teresa Horbach. No question. But hadn't that muscle tissue been found, we wouldn't have known who the victim was. We wouldn't have known. I, I still can't bullshit on the muscle tissue. Yep. No, yeah. you, you, I, I, I mean, I if can't, they had a whole leg bone, if they, I can't had, disagree. Like, if they had the whole leg bone, yeah, I might be able to say, yeah, but they have pieces like finger size Cor pieces. At correct. Best. So correct. There is no way the bone is reduced down that much, and there's still meat. Correct. Um, my understanding was that there was a little bit of charred muscle tissue uh, on a bone that was called item BZ, only a tiny bit of muscle tissue, and it was charred, it was burnt. Um, the DNA obviously was badly fragmented, but guys, we can dispel all of that because all we need is the bones. And with a new Andy rapid DNA system, uh, the bones can be tested. And the gentleman who devised the system says that he can come up with a DNA, a full DNA profile. But guys, we know we don't have. The bones. Uh, well, Jack's that system, bone, uh, sorry, BB. that bone. Oh, sorry, that bone with the muscle tissue on it would have had to have been not calcited, and correct. Therefore, correct. should have been able to have the marrow tested. Yeah, correct. It correct. Still have meat on it. There, it, I mean, the story can't go both ways. Correct. You know? Correct. But the other, the other important bone, uh, BB, was the the um, pelvic bone that was found at the Manitowoc County Gravel Pit. When because that bone has been sliced, you can actually see the internal structure of the bone. Uh, right, and that's, I saw that's the one why I say it could yes. have been somebody who knew too much what he was doing because <clears throat> there was no reason to slice off that tip of the hip there. Correct. It, yes, it was. It was an unusual cut. Um, there's no no question about that. But then again, BB. They could have done uh, further cutting to reduce the size of the fragments that they were burning. So, Lord knows what would have happened. But clearly, clearly, Teresa Hope, in my opinion, she was dismembered, cut up to pieces, and burnt. Jack61, do you have a final comment? Yeah, just thinking about that box of bones and what all was found, can't forget that I'm pretty sure it was Pevito, if I remember the name correctly, found that yes. golf ball size. And that was found after a box of bones was turned in and rushed off to Colhane. Yes, yes. They were still finding uh, uh, bones. They, were full. they found also uh, tissue as well. Um, they found blood, of course, um, item CX in the quarry. But I think it was Kale's or Michael's quarry, where they found some tissue samples, but yep. according to the according to the uh, caso, it didn't turn out to be human. So it could have been like animal remains, uh, but they said that it wasn't human. Well, what I found interesting about Pevito is that he allegedly found this golf ball chunk or whatever. Uh, after they had taken everything out of wherever they were doing that, all the sifting and whatever. Yes. And suddenly he finds this like a day later or whenever it was, maybe two days later. This is an interesting thing. Oh, it sure is. It sure is. And here's, here's the big problem, right? Um, where's the rest of 
the victim's skeletal remains. That's right. right. Were they right. were they actually dug out at the burial site? Was the killer? There's only only uh, I know I'm only there's only a suggestion. Did the killer temporarily store the body parts at the burial site and was progressively burning them? Right. You just don't know. Yeah. Sammy. Sammy. T1 is asking, um, Dr. Silkman, can the swabs from Stephen Avery's and Teresa Hallback's vehicle be micro-tested and compared for origin to determine if the swabs were swapped to place Stephen Avery in the RAV? It, it, look, no doubt. No doubt. What you, If the swabs are still present, you do micro-trace analysis. You really get into what's present on those swabs. So you don't know whether they can reveal uh, pollen, dirt, uh, toothpaste, <laughs> anything. So they need to be microanalyzed. And the reason why I say that is that look what happened when they tested item FL, right? They did microtrace analysis and they found no presence of bone but the presence of wood. Um, guys, would someone be kind enough to take over the questioning for a couple of minutes? Field the questions? Sure. Yep. I'll be back yeah. in a minute. Thank you, guys. I have a question for everybody. So what do we have actually that's left for the evidence? The bones were given away. Item FL was destroyed. Uh, we don't know anything about the RAV. It's up in the air. What else is there? There are, there are still some human remains left, but they didn't give everything back to the family, but they gave a lot of it away. So pretty thin shell. Oh. I was under the impression, I could be very wrong, that they gave out all human. There's, From there's, my understanding that they did. No, there's still yeah. some left. There's still some left. Why would they leave him? Well, that be interesting. Yeah. Well, you, you got to remember that Colhane, or not Colhane, Eisenberg, you know she had a final report. Yeah. That's based on based on that, as I, as I understand it now, that there's still some left. They didn't pull out every single thing. There's still some left. I, I can't say exactly what. I'd have to go back and reread that, but I'm pretty sure that's right. I think there I was some suspected. I well, thought in sure. one of the phone calls, they said something like uh, one of the messed up phone calls that got made. Something to the effect that they dug through the bag and pulled out everything they thought was human remains or something. Super yeah, Mario something. Maker 2 Glitch Hunters said he didn't know the item FL had been destroyed. What we're talking about is KZ blew that out of the water. Yeah, no. No DNA, um, it's wood and paint on it, no bones. All their really claims rough. about it having gone through anybody's body was totally abolished completely. Yeah, and the reason um, we cannot retest the item FL is because cocaine contaminated it. Remember that part? Yes. Uh -huh. And used it up. And, and used, used it, it all. all. Correct, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then she asked for the deviation of the protocol. Yeah. And you yeah. know who signed off on that was not even her supervisor. So no one signed it. Apparently except, she brought except, it to someone who was from another area. Lab. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I remember that too. I mean, how shady is that? Is that not shady enough? For her to be in some very serious trouble. Yeah. How about Mr. Norm Gone, who said, oh, come on. You have to leave room for some common sense. <laughs> Remember, we're dealing with some <laughs> sensitive technology here. <laughs> common yeah, sense. Yeah, really? <laughs> oh, come on. Oh, my gosh. That got my blood boiling. That scene. Common oh. sense gone. Yeah, common sense gone. <laughs> Who invented the whole thing about biological preservation of biological uh, material? Yeah. 
potentially exculpatory. And he goes, oh, come on. Jury has common sense. I know they do. They will be able to figure out. It sounds good to me. Remember? Oh, he was so convincing. Mm -hmm. When the reporters were looking just like at him like, huh? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, we were talking about science like that. I mean, you know, we're not talking about, you know, a hangnail. We're talking about. I know. And in regards to the bones being uh, cut up with, um, there was a evidence of, how should I word this? Sorry, English is my second language. Did somebody use, um, <laughs> did somebody use some tools to cut up the bones? Yes. A, yeah. Hexos. Didn't she, uh, Kathleen Zellner, didn't she say that um, she was hinting like deer hunters, somebody who would dress a deer would have all those tools and they would know what they were doing. Sure. Yeah, they look They look at a deer kit at one point in time. Correct. Yeah. Uh, correct. correct. I think, I think in, uh, uh, sorry guys, I think in a later podcast, we'll look at that. Uh, we'll look at the bones and because uh, one of her experts, I think it was Dr. Symes, had all the tools in front of him and one of them was a deer dressing kit. So he knows the size of the blade that caused the cuts. Uh, and uh, a deer dressing kit has got the whole lot. That's all you need. I, don't now, know, well, the, I know that Sturdivant was looking for a hacksaw blade on the 7th or 8th. I mean, it's in, it's in one of oh, the, the really? case or one of the, yes, he was. He Correct. was actively look. He was actively looking for a hacksaw, hacksaw blade. Correct. Wow. Well, now we also went through, and this was probably last year, maybe even longer ago. <laughs> and we're looking at every individual there that had ma maybe some pretty massive hunting kits, maybe for a bear. <laughs> no names mentioned, right? Uh uh, no, no. No, no, no names mentioned, correct. And uh, there were, uh, as we know, there were several hunters, but um, again, you know, you've got to be cautious about speculating. But there's no doubt someone with skill um, would be needed to cut apart a human body and also to dispose of it. Um, yeah, it's pretty horrendous. Isn't that so funny though? Uh, you can be seeking out, you know, the signs of an individual that might be capable of such a thing. Um, Correct. if that happened to a neighbor, I get along with my neighbors, but let's say that happened to one of my neighbors <laughs> Sammy, and I didn't get trying, along with them. What are you trying to admit on if, this podcast? If I had that crap that was on that computer and I had a kit that, you know, could potentially be, make it very easy for me to dismember anyone or anything, would yes. I not become a suspect instantly? Could I look at them and say, you're just speculating? Yes. Um, Thank you, Sammy. Look, there's no, there's no doubt. Um, everything in this case is wrong in terms of looking at suspects, potential suspects. Um, normally, what would happen is that uh, you look at the uh, all the people that the victim knew, uh, friends, lovers, boyfriends, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You start there, and then you work your way out. But in this particular investigation, as we've seen, uh, it actually happened the other way around. It started at the furthest person you could think of, Stephen Avery, and it stopped right there. Nobody else was seriously looked at. Nobody else had um, a civil lawsuit apart from Stephen. Uh, and it's really bizarre. Like if this murder had, say, occurred in, say, Japan, Germany or England, um, I could tell you right now, all the people that were close to Teresa Hobart, all of them would have been hauled in, all of them would have been questioned and all of them would have been asked to give an alibi. Now, uh, they know the statistics and even Tom Fassbender even said it in court the people that we love the most are likely the people that are going to end up killing you. Did they ask for 
um, did they ask for um, uh, alibis from Scott Blodorn? Did they ask for alibis from Ryan Hilligus? No, they didn't, which is completely bizarre. But that's what happened. Guys, do we have any further comments? But I agree with you, Sammy. Uh, you start from the closest people and you work your way out. But to me, it's a pretty obvious rush to judgment, nail Stephen Avery and do it quick. Oh, yeah, they had Sammy, to. Sammy, Sammy. They had to, you know. Correct, correct. Uh, and, you know, I've read Ken Kratz's book and, uh, you know, it's remarkable that he even said that we get, I think it was November the 3rd, and knocked on his door and says, guess what? You're not going to believe it. Right, so already they're pointing the finger at Stephen Avery before they knew anything about the case, and it's like, hello, this is not right. But yet it happened. It really did happen, guys. Do we have any uh, final comments? I'm just a bit sensitive of the time. But do we have any final? The chat looks good. Okay, all right. Well, look, guys. Um, I like to thank. Uh, the listening audience, thank you so much for coming along and listening into the podcast. We appreciate it very much. We appreciate your support. Uh, if you like what we do, uh, please subscribe to our channel. Um, like I said, we've got uh, a website, we've got Facebook, we've got Twitter. Uh, come and join us on Discord. Leave your questions. Um, there, are, there are people on chat just about basically all the time. Um, welcoming new people and answering questions. And, uh, you know, we've got an excellent team at Foul Play. I'm uh, very proud of them. And, um, guys, anything else? Any any uh, last-minute announcements? All right. Uh, Jack61. Uh, if you wanted to mention anything about the upcoming uh, case readings, Oh, yes. Um, what we're going to do is a few new things uh, at Foul Play. We're going to be doing some readings of the uh, cases. So various testimonies we're going to read out, record, and uh, we can do like a question and answer session uh, like we do very much like a podcast. So we'll re-record the testimony. Um, feature it in a premiere is that your way of thinking as well jack uh pre-recording it releasing it as a yeah. premiere and discussion yes and then people can listen at their leisure you know we're going to just turn it on and just listen yeah. you know for those that don't really like to read yes yes we're going to do that uh the other thing that we're going to do is uh some of the, my presentations that i've done in the past um we might also do podcasts like this, whereby we go through my presentation and I'll narrate it, uh, update it, narrate it, and then we can have discussions. But likely we'll do that after we finish MAM 2, because that way we've looked at all the forensic evidence, be in a much stronger and better position to really examine the case. Uh, and for me, this goes to show. Um, the importance of what Kathleen Zell is doing. She's hired the best of the best to uh, forensically examine the case. And as you can see in today's podcast, uh, her experts took apart the fire pit. Uh, that clearly cannot be the primary burn site. If you burn a human being, there are certain requirements that you need. It's physics. It's chemistry. Uh, you can't get away from it. And none of those elements were present in the burn pit. Stephen Avery did not burn any, no human being was burned in that burn pit. And clearly, if you look at Stephen Avery, uh, sorry, Brendan Stassi's confession, it made no sense whatsoever. And the investigators, Fassbender and Uyghur, they knew he was, he had no idea what he was talking about. Yet they still went. So shame on those two guys. All right, guys. Well, I'd like to thank uh, the panel. I'd like to thank everyone for their uh, input. 
And Neverly, do you have a quick comment? Yes. So it doesn't come like a surprise to you, Dr. Silkman. A bunch of us, pretty much all of us, would like to see a podcast with you and Magilla. Oh, so yes. raise yourself and let's make this happen. Yes, that would be really, yeah, really we good. We took a vote and it was all thumbs up. Yes, it would be awesome. So if Magilla, if you're out there and you're listening, uh, hopefully we can get together at some stage and do a casual podcast like this. Um, you know, we can discuss your research, um, discuss anything you want, and it'll be awesome. I think it'll be awesome. Thank you so much, guys. So uh, if there are no further comments, um, may all your uh, loved ones and family be safe from the coronavirus. This is a world-changing event. Uh, all of us uh, will be affected in some way. Uh, keep safe. And uh, hopefully, guys, we'll see you all next week. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. This has been a Foul Play production.